Dear students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am V N Prabhakar from the Archaeological Survey of India. In the paper on principles and methods of archaeology, we will be uh, discussing uh, on the post excavation analysis of archaeological artifacts in this uh, module. So, in the course of excavation, uh, we do the destruction because once we excavate, we remove, we remove the archaeological layers and deposits. We are totally destroying the ancient. Uh, habitations. So, it is an irreversible process. So, we need to be very careful, we need to be very methodical in uh, documenting and retrieving the data and uh, it is an unrepeatable experience because we cannot go again and again to do the excavation to find the same kind of things. Once it is removed, it is gone. So, we have we need to be very careful and what we find here, we find here uh, materials, uh, culture of the past human beings uh, commonly known as the artifacts which are humanly made or modified portable objects. It may be anything, it may be a stone tool, it may be a pottery and uh, metal weapons, it may be anything. So, these artifacts, they actually help in understanding the human past and it is uh, with these artifacts, we tend to understand the uh, past culture, past technology, past functions, what kind of trade and contacts, how they utilize the uh, local environment, all these kind of things are there. So, in this module, we will be understanding about the post excavation analysis that is after excavation we retrieve the artifacts and what kind of analysis they can be done on the artifacts and uh, along with possible scientific investigations. I will be also discussing about certain scientific investigations that can uh, help in understanding. So, there is a wide range of uh, uh, things we find from the archaeological uh, excavation. So, this, uh, this can be broadly classified into based on the material, based on the raw material. It may be a stone artifact, it may be a metal artifact, it may be ceramic or pottery and it can be organic remains. So, broadly four categories uh, I have done here but it, there may be more and more categories also. But uh, these four categories we will be dealing one by one here. And uh, even while carrying out the excavations also, it is not only the post excavation uh, analysis or research that is important. It is during uh, excavation also, we need to be very careful and there in the site itself also, we can uh, uh, retrieve the data in a more scientific and methodological manner. So, in the first instance, uh, the soil samples, whatever we are excavating, that are, that are, they are more important. We can uh, retrieve the soil samples, we can sample them at relative depths from the surface, label them and keep them safely for having various scientific investigations like uh, we can do the phytolith and the pollen studies, uh, we can do uh, this kind of phytolith studies of the uh, to understand the past plant remains because the phytolith they consist of uh, silica based inorganic materials that are preserved for a very longer period of time and they have different uh, morphology depending upon the plant species. So, if we uh, do a microscopic study of the phytolith, we can understand what kind of plant remains uh, species were there. Similarly, pollens. Pollens, they are better uh, preserved in the lake uh, like environment. So, wherever there are uh, evidence of uh, paleo lakes or ancient lakes, we can do a core drilling or even excavation to retrieve the soil samples in which the pollen again is uh, uh, studied. So, the organic samples, they are also retrieved during the course of excavation using uh, flotation techniques. I mean, there are uh, very uh, uh, simplistic uh, flotation techniques are available. Uh, we retrieve the soil samples, put in a bucket of water, the uh, simple organic materials, they float on the surface, they can be sieved and kept into and uh, that can be studied. So, the charred grains, the gra grains uh, that, uh, that were accidentally fired and charred during the ancient environment, they are uh, very easily detected using this uh, flotation techniques and uh, even the micro charcoal which are very good evidences of understanding the past uh, uh, plant species, they can also be retrieved and uh, this can be uh, treated and um, studied under a microscopic uh, environment by the paleobotanist because it requires a, a specialized uh, understanding of uh, plant species, their morphology, their identification. So, there is a separate branch of archaeology known as paleobotany in which uh, the uh, botanists they study the uh, remains like the char grains, phytolith, pollens uh, and other microcharcal remains to reconstruct the plant environment during the past. So, coming to the post excavation uh, thing, I mean uh, one, one is the, uh, I, I quoted an example of how during the excavation itself we can do a preliminary sort of uh, 
research, uh, preliminary sort of ident identification using a microscope, even in the field also we can do the preliminary understanding. But uh, coming to the post excavation, uh, we retrieve the uh, faunal remains also from excavation. So that is studied by uh, uh, archaeozoologists like paleobotanists for botanical remains, archaeozoologists for uh, uh, faunal remains. Uh, they kind of identify the species, whether it is a dom domesticated one or the wild, wild variety. Then uh, from that we can reconstruct the diet, then grazing patterns can be identified, the migratory patterns can be identified. If we use more sophisticated scientific technologies like uh, isotopic analysis can be used to understand the migratory patterns and the paleo diseases can be identified. So there are also human modified um, items which are found uh, from the excavations and there are, these are of several classes uh, uh, from the archaeological find this can be uh, studied in terms of human exploitation and the, how they were responding the past humans have been responding to the environment. So these are all uh, the various kind of uh, things which we fi find from the uh, archaeological excavations. So now we will uh, study one by one we have uh, uh, seen st uh, stone uh, artifacts and the metals and the ceramics and other kind of classification which I showed you. So one by one we will be uh, studying about the artifacts. So first we take up the stone artifacts. The stone artifacts are plentiful. It may be a simple uh, uh, stone tool uh, datable to the Paleolithic period or a, a sophisticated bead of the Chalcolithic period. So there are various kind of uh, things and again they are the best preserved one because it is inorganic in nature and uh, based on the hardness of the stone material they are preserved very well. The hardness of the stone they are measured in a, um, a scale of hardness from 1 to 10 known as the most scale of hardness. Uh, one is of talc and 10 is of diamond. Diamond is the most hardest of the ones. So they are classified as per the hardness also and based on the specific gravity. These are all the preliminary tools. I mean how to uh, and know whether it is a, it's a, a stone of talc or a, what is the raw metal steatite or quartz. So these kind of simplistic uh, tools can be used to identify and a more specific answer can be obtained by, by measuring the specific gravity of a particular sample. So once this kind of preliminary analysis uh, were completed, then more detailed uh, understanding can be done. What kind of understanding can be done? Uh, we can uh, inquire into the raw material of the material of the stone. We can inquire into the provenance analysis. Provenance means from where this raw material came. For example, uh, uh, a stone uh, uh, found in uh, Harappa in the Harappan civilization context may not be locally available. They might have obtained it from a very distant past, distant area. So this can be understood, I mean like a quartz material it is found only in the Gujarat area but if it is found in Harappa then we can uh, uh, fairly say without even scientific analysis okay this could have been ca ca come from the Gujarat area. So that is the provenance from where it is originated. So we can also understand the technology of manufacture, how the uh, certain kind of uh, if it is a tool how it was manufactured that can be understood and various uh, scientific tools can also be used to understand the technology. And then we can do the statistical analysis. I mean what kind of uh, stones are used predominantly whether it is a locally available stone or it is coming from outside. So this can be understood using a statistical analysis. Then the functional aspect how this uh, tools could have been used what kind of uh, techniques can be used to understand the function of the uh, artifact itself. So these are all some of the uh, key aspects and how a raw material identification. Raw material ident identification is the first step to understand the prehistoric economy. For example, even if you go to the prehistoric context, uh, uh, coming into the Mesolithic or the Upper Paleolithic period, we find certain uh, change in the materials. In the prehistoric age, normally they were using the locally available material, either it may be quartzite, it may be uh, even basalt, limestone, various kind of stones that are locally available were used for making the hand axe, choppers, cleavers, various kind of tools. But if we come to the Mesolithic or the Upper Paleolithic period, we suddenly start to get the siliceous materials like agate, carnelian, chalcedony and they were used for uh, preferred for making the stone tools because they were very hard and uh, again it can be used uh, very worked very easily also in certain contexts by heating these stones to a certain degree of uh, temperature and this can be hafted also. And basically these siliceous materials they are mostly of the basaltic origin. 
So, it gives a clear indication if, if, if uh, the siliceous materials are found far away from the basaltic region, then we can clearly say there is a contact be developing between different groups of people and how they were interacting with each other. So, raw material identification helps in provenance studies also and also the prehistoric economy, how the humans they contact between each other even for the economic benefits. They might be trading also, they might be giving back uh, something else for also. So, the provenance study is a very important aspect in understanding the cultural and economic interaction of the past societies. It can be uh, carried out by both visual examination as I told you, just looking into the uh, stone, the structure we can say uh, what kind of uh, category of stone it belongs to and also scientific investigation. So, the vis visual examination it can be uh, carried out by identifying the distinguishable markers. I mean, whether uh, uh, the grain size also is, is one marker and also the uh, specific gravity is also one marker that is a slightly scientific technique. But if you look into the uh, structure of the uh, stone by simply looking into the surface, then we can also make broad based classifications. And we can see during the prehistoric period, the local, as I told you, local raw materials were preferred and gradually the advancement in uh, culture, it indicates long distance trade. Gradually when they developed, they were acquiring more and more, they were coming into contact with the distant uh, cultural uh, complexes and they were uh, importing exotic materials also. So, for example, uh, here uh, I have shown the example of uh, uh, how the grinding stones, because in the uh, prehistoric society or the protohistoric society, uh, when the humans started to settle down, they were uh, uh, producing agricultural products, they were producing uh, wheat, uh, barley and various other uh, uh, crops, they have to grind them, uh, grind them to make a flour, to make uh, uh, something edible to eat. So, what happened? The grinding stone becomes a very important component of the proto-historic economy and in the case of Harappan civilization, we are seeing uh, the Harappans, they are searching far and wide for better quality grinding stones. Grinding stones with uh, very good uh, percentage of quartz or quartzite, it becomes really hard. So, they are mostly uh, preferred. So, here uh, there is a uh, map showing how the grinding stone uh, um, from the Kalyana hills in northern Haryana, it has been transported to various localities of the uh, Harappan civilization. Ultimately, it is reaching Harappa. Harappa is nearly 400 or 500 kilometers from the raw material source. So, this sort of uh, economy, it was uh, thriving in the third millennium BCE just for the sake of uh, grinding stones because they, they need to have a very harder material for the grinding various uh, cereals. So, uh, similarly, we can also look into the technology of manufacture, how the stone tools could have been uh, uh, manufactured. So, uh, just understanding the technology of manufacture, we can uh, also understand which period it belongs to also. So, the technology of manufacture started uh, uh, roughly around uh, uh, 2 million or 3 million years ago, depending upon the region from where it uh, comes from, the stone tools are the early, earliest remnants of the human culture. They were manufactured using different technologies. So, archaeologists, they, they use different uh, terminologies to define them like Old Oven, Acheulean, Levalloisian and all these kind of things can be seen in the uh, uh, literature. Also, we have uh, uh, various, uh, this kind of uh, uh, tool technology, they have a clear cut markers on the stone tool itself, whether it is a direct percussion, whether they are hitting the stone directly with another stone or a hammer stone to remove the flakes or they are using a indirect hammer technique. So, these kind of uh, things can be uh, understood looking into the uh, flake pattern, looking into the radiation pattern, uh, how the uh, negative flex cars are there. So, this can be very easily understood because the soft hammer technique uh, using wood, wood hammer or antler, they were used to remove very smaller flakes in a very controlled manner. So, these kind of uh, things can be very easily understood looking into the manufacture and uh, looking into the manufacture also, we can understand what kind of uh, important uh, hammers they could have used that uh, and uh, the how they could have held the stone whether it is a right-handed uh, technique or a left-handed technique, all these kind of things can be understood. So, another uh, technique uh, which emerged during the Mesolithic or the uh, later uh, uh, Upper Paleolithic period is the pressure flaking technique. So, it was uh, used uh, during the Upper and the Mesolithic period to produce uh, stone tools of very exceptional shape. I mean, we can uh, remove flakes of very small size using uh, uh, soft tools and uh, to have a very sharp edge or a very desired 
shape can be obtained. So the, the replication, how we also understand the technology because the replication, we do the experimental studies, the many pre students, they have really advanced uh, in this, they have they exactly reproduce the same kind of tools, uh, uh, imagining the same kind of technology and uh, try to understand the manufacturing process. Even the various stages of manufactures can be understood. From the period, prehistoric period onwards, entering into the various technological stages, uh, coming into the age of the Chalcolithic period, again the stone was used continuously. The stone was not uh, 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 discarded like Chalcolithic means uh, they were using copper as well as the stone. So in the uh, ch Chalcolithic period, the, uh, the classical example is the Harappan civilization where they were obtaining uh, a particular type of uh, stone from the uh, Rohri area in Sindh and they were uh, uh, exporting into all, uh, all parts of the Harappan, uh, uh, Harappan civilization. So ha Harappan region they were trading these things also and they are using a different technique uh, to uh, kind of uh, flake uh, these things also. So they were also during the same process they understood uh, the stones can also be used for making different kind of ornaments. So different kind of ornaments can be produced, the smaller and the bigger beads can be uh, produced and they, they have to drill these beads also because uh, they have to make a perforation so that it can be strung as a necklace. So, in order to understand what kind of tools they might have used to make perforation, I mean, we use uh, uh, replication studies which has which was perfected by uh, uh, Professor Mark Kenoyer. So, in this uh, silicone impression of the bead hole impression is is uh, uh, made, and then it is studied at a scanning and electron micro microscope. Uh, there's a uh, various kind of uh, images have been uh, shown here. You can understand how various techniques produce different kind of surface morphology. The top right is of uh, a copper drill, how uh, repeated use of copper drill, it heats up the copper drill, it has to be, it, it flares up, it uh, bulges out, it has to be cut again, polished, then again reused. So you can see the various kind of uh, bulges on the surface, but on the bottom uh, left, the two images on the bottom, they were man manufactured using a special type of drill known as urnestite. The Harappans mastered the use of urnestite. They use this drill type to make very perfect uh, bore holes of these uh, beads of siliceous materials. That's why the surface is very smooth and polished. The bottom right one, extreme right one is of a modern example. It is from a modern uh, uh, bead uh, from Kambat where even today the bead manufacturer uses uh, double tipped diamond drill because the diamond uh, and the double tip diamond drilling technique came around the first millennium BCE and it was perfected later on. So even today the Kambad bead manufacturer, they use the double tip diamond drill and you can see the deep grooves cut into the stone because diamond being very harder, so this can be very understood. So looking into the surface morphology, we can understand various kind of bead drilling technology. Next comes the statistical analysis. So this statistical analysis, it is done based on various kind of uh, analytical measurements. If it is a stone tool, you can uh, measure the length, breadth, thickness, and also the angle of the bulb of percussion, the angle of the striking platform. So all these things, uh, if a very good uh, considerable data set is there, we can uh, define patterns. Similarly, in the case of beads also, we can do various kind of uh, statistical uh, analysis to understand uh, is there any pattern emerging? If there is any local pattern, is there? If there, if a bead is manufactured from a, a particular site, it can be tallied with the drills found from the site also uh, by measuring the borehole Im impressions. So these kind of uh, things are also possible as an extension. Uh, next comes the functional analysis. This is one very important aspect on what the stone tools might have been used. They were they were manufacturing different type of tools, but for which purpose exactly they were using? So one technique is the micro topography. I mean, because continuous use of the stone tools on uh, any surface, it uh, clearly uh, chips very minute frag fragments. And if it is viewed under a microscope, we can understand the micro topography. So these kind of uh, things can be used and also continuous use of stone tools on uh, uh, materials like leather, wood, or uh, even crops, it produces a polish. Some kind of polish is produced for, uh, when it is used for a continuous period of time. So this kind of uh, polishes can be detected under a, a simple binocular microscope uh, and it has been classified at least six type of uh, uh, polishes have been identified based on the materials they have been used. They are uh, wood, bone, hide, meat, antler and non-woody plants. 
so these different categories of materials if they were uh, cut using uh, a stone tool they give a clear uh, polish on the surface so these, these things can be very easily detected using a microscope and can be developed and similarly how you can one can test this same uh, replication can be done experimental studies uh, duplicating the same kind of uh, tools then using them on different kind of materials and uh, again viewing them under a microscope gives a comparative analysis of the polishes also so this is uh, a functional aspect then, then comes the organic remains uh, how how the organic remains can be understood or uh, studied uh, using the scientific techniques we have seen the stone uh, uh, tools and the stone beads, uh, manufacturing, functional, all those things and how organic remains can be studied. The organic remains consist of different categories. It may be a bone, wood, antler, shell, ivory, textile, leather, anything. But again, depending upon the uh, uh, preservation conditions, we find very few organic remains because uh, if it is the preservation conditions is not suitable, they will all decompose and completely disappear. Unlike the uh, the stone artifacts. So this is very difficult and even the technological markers on the stone tools or uh, and the uh, bone tools or wooden tools it is very difficult to uh, understand also. So it is uh, very difficult to even retrieve the organic remains because they, they might be decomposed easily so it is very difficult. Uh, but certain organic remains are the shell artifacts they, they are uh, very well preserved because of the uh, nature of the material and we can understand uh, uh, from the waste products and the fi finished products and the technique of manufacture because if we uh, look into the discarded materials particularly from the historical context and the Harappan context we can see very good uh, uh, impressions of the saw they were using to cut the shell complete shell so this is uh, uh, useful in understanding the technique of manufacture of shell products because they are preserved well otherwise if you look into other textile remains or the leather remains, it is very difficult uh, to find them. So wood is a very important component. If you look into the uh, earliest uh, examples of wood remains, in the Harappan context we have uh, wood remains from the uh, burials, the wood the senators were, were, uh, were preferred of uh, uh, different woods, but again it is not well preserved, okay, it decomposes. Uh, uh, depending upon the preservation conditions but it was a very uh, very important uh, building material wood uh, along with uh, other uh, bricks and uh, stone they were being using as a building material even uh, farming uh, material would have been manufactured furniture was one another important item uh, boats sheep uh, carpentry tools toys figurines in name it and you they might have manufactured uh, many different items we have examples of descriptive evidence of these kind of wooden uh, materials from other civilizations but we don't have from uh, the Indian co context because uh, they are preserved very well in the marine or their dry environments but the very well preserved uh, some of the wooden remains are from the great uh, pyramid of Sheops where a dismantled cedar wood boat uh, is completely preserved here in one of the chambers. They might have used this boat to carry the funerary remains and then they dismantled it and kept it there itself. So this is a very good uh, uh, evidence of how they were manufacturing the uh, boats. But in the Indian context, uh, we have uh, very less remains. We don't have uh, this kind of uh, wooden boats or wooden uh, transportation material. But there are certain uh, ex exceptions. We have a, a wooden boat canoe from, from Patanam. It is excavated and datable to around the early centuries of the common era. So we have a wooden canoe there and also one uh, wooden boat was excavated at a site known as uh, Kadakarapalli in Kerala where also they have found the remains of a wooden boat. It helps to understand the kind of manufacture, how they were uh, uh, combining together the wooden planks and all to manufacture the entire boat. Next comes the plant fibers how we can understand how we can study the plant fibers plant fibers they are completely decomposed it is not at all found uh, they are very very rare in the archaeological context uh, but they were they were being used from the very earliest period like in the in the context of uh, megalithic uh, in the in the context of mehergad uh, from uh, in, in a site in pakistan we know from the neolithic period around 7000 6000 bce they were using cotton uh, thread to string a uh, copper bead. So we have evidence like that. But how they, they, they are found, I mean they are found uh, 
uh, kind of in a very good environment if the copper minerals are there. So, copper minerals they help in the preservation of the plant fibers and apart from uh, uh, various plant fibers also we have they might have used bamboo for manufacturing uh, baskets and other tools because we have evidence from the pottery impressions of uh, bamboo uh, corded uh, bas basketry sort of thing on the on the uh, uh, on the pottery or the bottom surface of the pottery or on the surface of the pottery and also uh, the arrowheads they preserve evidence of uh, certain bamboo species also this, so these are all kind of indirect evidences which are uh, really helpful uh, in understanding uh, uh, the plant fibers or the plant remains uh, during the ancient uh, period whereas there are scientific uh, uh, techniques it can be also be used to understand uh, the kind of uh, plant fibers even identify the species also like uh, uh, you can you can see how the uh, fibers uh, or the plant remains from a copper bead because the copper minerals they are uh, they, the copper minerals help in the preservation of these organic uh, remains and two examples are uh, uh, quoted here one is uh, uh, from the site of harappa where a copper uh, bead was found and inside that the silk thread was found so uh, looking at the morphology of the thread remains uh, comparing with the uh, modern uh, morphology it can be uh, understood that it could be thread. The bottom one is from uh, Dole Vira where again uh, from uh, inside a copper uh, bead we found uh, uh, thread remains and again if, when it was viewed under a scanning electron microscope it proved out to be either cotton or jute. So this kind of uh, uh, understandings can be uh, done and uh, plant remains uh, and the fibers since they are very rare in the uh, archaeological context this kind of uh, indirect techniques have to be used to investigate them. So next come the analysis of inorganic remains. Inorganic remains uh, they are the best, they, they are preserved very well, it consists of, again a very large uh, category of objects, it may be pottery, it may be metal objects both ferrous and non-ferrous consisting of iron, gold, silver, copper, bronze, lead, it may be anything glass, fans, stone objects, beads, tools, so it can be a uh, anything and uh, there are wide category and there are again different uh, techniques uh, that can be employed for understanding uh, the various things. The pottery is one among the most uh, numerous uh, finds from any excavation and it uh, because it, it is burnt to very high temperature it becomes very hard so it is also pre preserved very well. Again pottery production it is uh, very 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 difficult and the ancient uh, humans they have uh, master this technology, control of the fire, how in a closed environment the temperature can be uh, increased uh, even up to 1000 or 1100 degrees centigrade. So the pottery manufacture indirectly helped in the uh, smelting of uh, metal ores also. So this, this is everything is related, the pyrotechnology or the control of the fire which was very much helpful in uh, creating various kind of art artifacts. So, uh, this uh, pottery technology in the Harappan context again uh, it is uh, uh, very well understood uh, from sites like Harappa and uh, even uh, in the Indian context we have sites like Baro, Tarkan, Valadera, Khirsara, Rakigadi where evidence of uh, updraft kilns have been found. This is a special type of uh, kilns you can see uh, from this slide how uh, for nearly 700 years the same area in Harappa which was used by the potters okay smaller sized kilns dating back to 3300 BCE to the latest to 2400 BCE the larger sized kilns so they have been found and the right extreme is the very good example uh, from a site known as Khirsara in uh, Gujarat excavated by the archaeological survey of India even up to the platform the kiln is very well pre preserved you can see there is a platform there and there is a, a large opening for uh, putting in the, in the fuel there the uh, firewood is uh, placed be below the uh, platform level it is uh, burnt to very high temperature then there uh, the uh, heat uh, is radiated through the smaller holes uh, you can see on the platform then there is a dome covering on the top so inside a, a closed environment the temperature reaches very high temperature and the pottery could be uh, manufactured and the desired uh, desired color and desired uh, uh, the strength can be obtained. So, but how do we understand using scientific techniques and the pottery technology? So, the pottery technology lies in the 
a selection of the clay, what kind of clay they select, they, how they levigate, how they sort out the various kind of clay, how they filter out the various impurities. So, these things can be understood by a thin section study. We can cut a thin slice of the pottery, then view under a polarizing microscope to understand the various kind of mineral inclusions then uh, calculate the statistics of the mineral inclusions then uh, we can understand what is the grain size whether they are using a smaller grain size or the bigger grain size so if the smaller grain size they are sorting out uh, the clay they were cleaning the impurities they were removing the unwanted things and they were receiving it and uh, obtaining a very fine paste so these kind of uh, techniques can be identified and again we can compare the clay from the pottery as well as the raw material sources we can uh, collect clay from the near uh, nearby uh, clay sources and then compare them so these kind of studies are available again sophisticated equipment can also be used using scanning electron microscope uh, with uh, edx or energy dispersive uh, uh, x-ray analysis and x-ray diffraction they can also use to understand the mineral composition of the pottery and again the clay can be analyzed to correlate so, the reserve slip where are RSSW of the Harappan period, which is a distinct ceramic type uh, found in the Kutch region. It has been uh, studied extensively and uh, these kind of uh, ceramics, they are found in the Kutch region and also Mohenjo-Dado, Chanudado and some sites in Mesopotamia. So, these uh, uh, pottery have been studied extensively and uh, the technology has also been understood. Another class of uh, ceramic is this kind of cooking vessels. It is a uh, Carinated cooking vessel, very typical of the Harappan period. The left one is a hallmark Harappan cooking vessel, the right one is the local imitation. So, the, looking into just the shape of this cooking vessel, one can understand uh, uh, it can it belongs to the Harappan period. So, similar type of uh, ceramics are found even in distant uh, regions like in Oman region. So, this clearly indicates movement of Harappan from one place to another place. So, looking into the uh, shape and the type, uh, then these kinds can be understood. How do we understand the pottery provenance? Like uh, briefly I touched uh, uh, before, the chemical analysis from the pottery can help in understanding for what uh, purpose they are used apart from the provenance. Provenance I uh, touched briefly. Uh, along with the provenance, we also understand what purpose, the functional aspect of the various kind of uh, 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 property. Uh, when the pot pottery, when they are used for storing various kind of uh, materials it can be milk it can be oil so if they can contain fatty acid and amino acid so it uh, penetrate into the surface of the pottery it gets into the pores and that can the, that can be analyzed using spectrometer and a technique known as uh, chromatography which help in identification different components of fats so this is one technique and also analysis of the lipids lipids starch granules and also dna bio biochemical analysis of plant residues this can be uh, studied by scraping a portion of the interior of the pottery then uh, doing the uh, cleaning process and uh, viewing under a spectrometer to understand the various uh, functions so we have been seeing various uh, uh, kind of tools uh, ceramics that have been used by the humans and one class of uh, uh, artifact used by the past humans is faience. Faience is uh, an object uh, which is also known as the early form of glass because if uh, the glass is a more refined form of faience. Faience is uh, ma manufactured using uh, uh, crushed quartz particles uh, mixed with flux agents and uh, coloring agents to produce various kind of materials. Like you can see uh, faience was used in the Harappan context to produce bangles, buttons, uh, beads and various kind of figurines also. So, this can also be studied using a, um, a microstructure analysis like uh, uh, this study have been done by Mark Kenoyer. So, two different type of manufacturing process have been identified from the Harappan uh, context. You can see the left hand one is uh, more coarser and the right hand one is, is less coarser, very fine. So, one type of faience is more coarser and another type of faience they were making it uh, very fine paste and manufacturing. So, this kind of broad based understanding can be done on what kind of materials they were manufactured using uh, this kind of fans can also be tallied with the evidences. And one more category is the glass. As I told the fans is the early form of glass when they refine the technology uh, glass they could produce glass and in the uh, and in the international context it is the 
glass was produced around 2500 BCE but in the Indian context we have glass around 1200 uh, BCE. They were used for producing various kind of uh, objects and artifacts and uh, again it is uh, manufactured using silica, silicon dioxide basically and alkali oxide uh, uh, then uh, using uh, lime which is used to stabilize the mixture and uh, so to make it less soluble in water. So under coloring agent. So all these kind of things. Uh, using a certain manufacturing process they could uh, uh, produce glass. So how do we understand glass? I mean glass coming from different region. How one can say this glass is coming from India, or it is coming from uh, Persia, it is coming from Egypt. So we can do again uh, uh, chemical analysis. One is the typological analysis because different culture produce different uh, products, uh, different type of materials and uh, artifacts. So that is uh, culture specific but also if you want to look into the composition of the material, so we can say from where they came from. Again, there are various kinds of uh, instrumentation techniques are available, X-ray based techniques are available, then uh, microscopic techniques are available. Uh, even the most sophisticated one is the LA-ICPMS that is uh, given here laser ablation inductively coupled mass spectrometry. So it is a nearly non-destructive uh, technique, a laser beam is penetrated into the gla glass artifact then it measures the various uh, chemical composition and from that we can understand uh, from where it could have been done. One such study was carried out from a site known as Copia in Uttar Pradesh uh, by Alok Kanungo. Uh, here it um, the various kind of glass artifacts and the, and the crucible in which the glass, well, the glass was manufactured it has been displayed. So finally we come to the metal artifacts. How the metal artifacts can also be uh, studied. We, there are various categories of metal artifacts. The copper appears very early in the archaeological record around uh, uh, 5th millennium BC in the South Asian context even though native copper was used because the copper available in the native or the natural context they can be beaten and hammered to produce various kind of artifacts because copper it is very easy to work when compared to uh, iron which appeared very later when the, when the ancient uh, humans they reached a very high uh, temperature. So there is a natural progression also. The copper appears very earlier then the uh, the last stage is the iron. So in between we have uh, a silver, lead, gold all these metals appear in the archaeological record. So how this can be studied? Again typological studies can be carried out and also sophisticated instrumentation techniques like uh, X-ray fluorescence, XRF for the compositional analysis optical emission spectroscopy there are various kind of techniques which can be used to understand the composition of the various uh, elements within the copper bronze artifacts or other materials the trace ele element analysis there is one more technique which is uh, uh, which measure the uh, rare earth elements it, it can be also studied using a methodology known as neutron activation analysis for obtaining the minute details and also the composition in a very detailed manner so ultimately it can be also be used to understand the prominence. So for any another important technique used for uh, prominence particularly the copper, lead and silver artifacts is the lead isotopic analysis. Isotopes they, they have the same atomic number but different mass number. So there are various, uh, various uh, elements of the same atomic number but different mass number so they are categorized and they are uh, radioactive as well as non-radioactive. So the, the radioactive ones are uh, uh, unstable and the non-radioactive ones are stable. So the stable isotopes even though they are non-radioactive they are found due to the radioactive decay of the another element. So these uh, things can be used for understanding the uh, prominence. The presence of uh, stable isotopes in metals and their and the ratios it it helps in the understanding their prominence so as the ores are coming from different sources they have different isotopic values the the ores coming from rajasthan northern rajasthan southern rajasthan like copper they are happened in northern rajasthan southern rajasthan even balochistan so all these uh, different sources they have different isotopic values so if these uh, uh, materials they are analyzed then we can delineate from where they are coming from so the lead isotopic uh, studies of copper, lead and silver, it can be very uh, very much helpful in identifying the sources because lead is always uh, present in very minute quantities even in copper and also silver. So again this is uh, measured using various instrumentations. Uh, one is the thermally ionized mass spectrometry known as the TIMS and another is the 
inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer than ICPMS. So, they are very highly sensitive and they can even measure uh, values up to a part per billion. Yen. So, uh, an example of this kind of uh, studies is uh, done by Randall Law of uh, University of Wisconsin. So, he uses a technique uh, uh, known as EDTA, he uses uh, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. It is a chemical which is used, used to leach out the radioactive material. So, it is a, a 0 0.05 percent in very uh, pure water. Uh, it, it is used to leach out the isotopic uh, radio iso iso isotopic components from these metal artifacts. So, these artifacts they are dipped in a, a bowl with a solution for uh, 5 to 10 minutes. Then the artifacts they are taken out, cleaned and dried and repacked. Then the solution it is measured in the instrumentation which I mentioned and we can develop plots, these kind of plots. So, different regions have the different isotopic values and from this plot we can say from where they are coming. If we uh, measure the isotopic values of these artifacts and we plot them against the isotopic values of the raw materials, we can very easily pinpoint from where they are coming from. So, this is uh, uh, copper, then this is uh, a lead lead objects from Dolla Vira and we also analyze the silver object. These are the silver objects and the, everything have been plotted. So, based on this analysis, a map has been developed. So, from this map, we can understand the various regions from where this uh, Dolla Vira Harappans, they might have uh, got the different materials. For example, uh, copper, it could have come from the Ambaji and the southern uh, uh, Gujarat, uh, Rajasthan border. Uh, and also from Balochistan, one distant source of Balochistan. Uh, some are coming from northern Rajasthan. You can see the wide range of uh, places from which uh, they are getting. And silver and lead also came from Ambaji because Ambaji also has silver and lead uh, uh, remains uh, and uh, also from southern Rajasthan sources. So, this kind of uh, variability, this kind of long distance trade really can be understood from this kind of scientific techniques. Otherwise, visual examination, it will not tell anything. No, no kind of information can be understood from the visual examination. Only the scientific uh, examination leads to large, uh, I mean, uh, leading to uh, 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 leading to answering a answer answers of uh, very important questions. Another important aspect is the metallographic analysis. How these metals themselves might have been manufactured. So, it is looking into the microscopic uh, a structure of the metals uh, like cutting a thin section and viewing under uh, microscope uh, then uh, we study them of the various phases I mean how whether it they were uh, annealing was then forging was then cold working every uh, part of the uh, manufacturing process it leaves a certain uh, uh, impression on the uh, microstructure so that can be analyzed and the various manufacturing techniques can be identified. So, one is the prominence, one is the functional and another is the manufacturing te uh, technique of the metal artifacts. So, we have been uh, uh, looking into the various categories of artifacts, uh, stone, organic, plant remains, uh, inorganic materials uh, and how they have been studied using uh, uh, typological studies as well as manufacturing studies, functional studies, statistical studies uh, and also metallographic or the manufacturing techniques. So, these kind of uh, uh, very broad based uh, uh, wide variety uh, excav post excavation analysis are available. Uh, it is uh, not only useful for the typological aspects, technology, manufacture, permanent studies can be easily understood. Uh, uh, the typological studies only a preliminary sort of uh, I think to looking into the visual aspect of the artifacts. Uh, it gives a cultural aspect uh, how the different culture produce different kind of uh, uh, materials and also cross-cultural uh, references can be obtained. If material of one culture is found in another culture, we can say there is a uh, borrowing. So, influence and symbology. So, these kind of things can be studied using the typology, but for uh, better understanding of uh, artifacts in a spatio-temporal context, uh, then we need to have scientific analysis, which uh, briefly I touched upon uh, during the course of this uh, uh, lecture and also various instrumentation techniques. Uh, uh, used uh, for identifying various category of the elements, compositional analysis, prominence and other things. But always a selection of a suitable uh, instrumentation, instrumentation technique is essential. It is not that uh, uh, every technique can be applied to every uh, material. So, we have to select a proper instrumentation technique uh, so that better results can be obtained. So, you can refer into 
uh, other parts of this uh, module to understand uh, you can read the e text uh, to have more detail about other techniques also and also the references part to develop your studies further thank you